Second reading, Jeremiah 31, verses 27 to 34. And I'll be reading from the Common English Bible. The time is coming, declares the Lord, when I will plant seeds in Israel and Judah, and both people and animals will spring up, just as I watched over them to dig up and pull down, to overthrow, destroy, and bring harm. So I will watch over them to build and plant, declares the Lord. In those days, people will no longer say, sour grapes eaten by parents leave a bitter taste in the mouths of their children, because everyone will die for their own sins, whoever eats sour grapes will have a bitter taste in their own mouths. The time is coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and Judah. It won't be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. They broke that covenant with me even though I was their husband, declares the Lord. No, this is the covenant I will make with the people of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my instructions within them and engrave them on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. They will no longer need to teach each other to say, know the Lord, because they will all know me. From the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their wrongdoing and never again remember their sins. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Retired Bishop Leontine Kelly was elected to the Episcopacy in the United Methodist Church in 1984. She was the second woman and the first African-American woman to be elected bishop of any major denomination. When Leontine was 10 years old, she lived with her parents in Cincinnati, Ohio. Her father was a pastor active in the community. One morning, as she was getting ready for school, she heard a knock on the front door. She ran down the stairs to answer it, and there on the step was an imposing woman with a confident air. Only later did Leontine find out that the visitor was Mary McLeod Bethune. Dr. Bethune was a prominent educator and civil rights leader and founder of the School for African American Students in Daytona Beach, Florida, that became Bethune-Cookman University and an advisor to President Franklin D. Roosevelt. Dr. Bethune was in town to raise money for her school, an effort which Leontine's father was helping. Now, Bishop Kelly says that as she looked up in awe at this imposing woman, Dr. Bethune looked down at her with no preliminary statement or question like, how are you this morning, or could you go get your parents? She simply looked at her and inquired, little girl, who do you plan to be? At the moment, the fifth grade girl had no plans to be anything other than a fifth grade girl. But the question started her thinking, and it came to guide her life, gaining more and more resonance as she came to understand just whom, to, was, just whom it was who was asking the question. The text this morning speaks of a new covenant God is making. And what is a covenant? Have any of you ever made a covenant? Anyone here made a covenant? Anyone married? Yes, made a covenant. What was the meaning of the original covenant God made with Moses at Mount Sinai? You know, when he went up to the mount, gave the Ten Commandments. Stan Duncan puts it this way. It was the central event for all Israelite life and thought in what we know of as the Old Testament and had a profound impact on Christian thinking in the New Testament. In this covenant, Yahweh, God, promised to liberate the Hebrews from slavery, and in return, they promised to act like liberated people. That meant two things, worshiping only God and treating others in the same manner that they had been treated by God. They were to live lives that were different from those of the other nations. They were a chosen, liberated people, and their only requirement was that they were to act like it. They should be different from their idolatrous, brutal neighbors. And this is the basic theological assumption of much of the Hebrew scriptures. So what's the difference between this covenant and the new covenant? 
Have you seen this? What's in your wallet? You seen that Capital One commercial a few years ago that asked this question? You know, the ones with the Vikings living in modern-day America, and at the end, one ask, what's in your wallet? Well, I think the difference between the covenants, the old and the new, have to do with what's in your heart. Listen to these words again. The time is coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and Judah. It won't be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. They broke that covenant with me, even though I was their husband, declares the Lord. No, this is the covenant that I will make with the people of Israel after that time. I will put my instructions within them and engrave them on their hearts. I will be their God, and they will be my people. They will no longer need to teach each other to say, Know the Lord, because they all will know me. From the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord, for I will forgive their wrongdoing and never again remember their sins. Like that verse, I will put my instructions within them and engrave them on their hearts. So what's in your heart? The Hebrew word for heart has the connotation of the authority within. The heart was regarded not just as the seat of emotions, but also of the will and thought. God has written, engraved, branded, tattooed the new covenant on our hearts. Anyone have a tattoo? No? I wouldn't mind having a tattoo, but I'm not really into pain, so... But if you do know someone that has a tattoo, and you probably do, it's there for good. It's permanent. Unless if you have it removed, and which I understand is even more painful than if you actually get one. So, do you know who John Wesley is? Founder of the United Methodist. John Wesley believed that there were three kinds of grace. Do you know what they are, the three kinds of grace? First is prevenient, second is justifying, and third is sanctifying. Prevenient grace is that is always there. Grace is always there, but we don't see it or realize it. Justifying grace is when we do realize the grace that is there in our lives, and therefore it's justified. And sanctifying grace is when we live in that grace and work towards perfection. We work toward loving God and our neighbors in all that we do. So you might be saying, where are you going with this? Well, here's where I'm going. God has engraved our hearts with love forgiveness, and liberation. This new covenant that God has given is within us. It is the prevenient grace that is there before we even know it. I have a colleague who explained it this way, prevenient grace. It's kind of like when you have a piece of broccoli stuck in your teeth that you don't know is there until a friend or someone says, hey, you have a little broccoli right there. It was there but you didn't know about it until it was brought to your attention. So what's in your heart? Have you seen or felt the love, the forgiveness, the liberation and grace that God has tattooed there? The story of Bishop Kelly that I shared earlier is a story of someone asking her that question, little girl, who do you plan to be? The question came to guide her life gaining more and more resonance as she came to understand just whom it was who was asking the question. It's a good question. Who do you plan to be? And even who do we as a worshiping community plan to be? It all depends on what's in your heart. As we, in the next few minutes, as I pray, I pray that we will listen 
slow down and recognize that God's covenantal mark is on all of us. Let us pray. Slow me down, O Lord, slow me down. Help our heart to hear your sound. Speak into our lives, Lord, speak now. Slow us down, O Lord, slow us down. Clear our minds, O Lord, clear our minds. Bring peace to that which I can't find. Take our worry thoughts, break our pride, and clear our minds, O Lord, clear our minds. Wake our soul, O Lord, wake our soul. With this mess we've made, make us whole. Of this life called ours, take control. Wake our soul, O Lord, wake our soul. Amen.